good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on wherever you're, you're joining us from. Welcome to our last webinar of the City Tree course. Today we are joined by our guest, Mr. Mr. Jones Baraza. Jones Baraza is an award winning cybersecurity engineer currently holding positions as the Chief, as the Chief Technology Officer at CTF Room and Lead Application Security Engineer and Country Manager at Nicholson LLC. He was honored with the prestigious Innovator of the Year Award in 2023 by the Science Institute, Change Makers Award. Additionally, Jones actively contributes to the Red Team Development Program Committee of Black Team Cybersecurity and is tasked with training the next generation of ethical hackers. John is also a champion for the child online protection, where he acts as the lead facilitator to the communications authority of Kenya's sponsored COP training via a priority to the African Advanced Level Telecommunications Institute. In this capacity, he has overseen the training of more than 500 law enforcement personnel, teachers, the National Parents Board and Secretariat, UN agencies, and other public and private entities on the safety of our children online. Now I'd like to welcome Mr. Jones Baraza. Mr. Jones Baraza, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Sylvia. So um, we we're going to discuss cyber safety for students. And I know the fact that we all um, interact with children for, uh, on a daily basis, whether it's through our homes or in our schools, it's important that we take a more proactive role towards securing our children. And this topic on cyber safety for students has not come at a better moment than now, considering the fact that um, we have a lot of challenges, we have a lot of threats facing children online, and it's up to us to ensure that we actually protect uh, these children. So for today, we are going to be uh, tackling four main uh, topics. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you with slides. I uh, only have a maximum of seven slides, so uh, don't, I won't bore you so much with slides. So we're going to cover four topics today, uh, students' online protection, uh, online risks facing students. Uh, we'll also cover incorporating cybersecurity in the classroom, then we'll finish off with laws that support child online protection. So, without taking so much time, I would like to jump into our topic of today. But before we do that, I would like, to, uh, I would like us to have a statistical preview of why it is important that we are having this discussion today. To begin with, uh, the amount of um, internet consum consumption globally um, is actually so, so high. And this has been enabled by the fact that uh, internet accessibility has grown over the years, uh, different regions, different countries, we've had uh, uh, um, internet service providers making data a bit more um, affordable. And as such, um, the rate at which um, the growth of the internet and also consumption of uh, um, the different activities within the, the, the global space actually has gone so high. So it is important for us to have this preview before we even proceed on jumping to, to understanding why this is important. Uh, from the first graph, you can see that we have um, some of the most visited um, some of the most visited websites. At the top, of course, you have Google. Um, you know, every time you have an issue, just say, ah, okay, uh, I want to understand this, okay, you just Google it. So basically, Google is a stands at the top. Then you have YouTube because of entertainment. You have to get entertained once in a while. We love music, we love watching um, videos, uh, movies, and what have you. Then, thirdly, we have Facebook, which we all know is a very a popular social networking um, platform. Then surprisingly, and not so surprisingly at the same time, we have two most, um, I would say unique, and they start within this particular uh, framework. We look at Pornhub. Pornhub is, a, is a, an adult website, uh, closely followed by Xvideos, which is also uh, an adult um, um, website, which serves a lot of adult content, that is. So considering the fact that this to um, form the top five websites that are visited globally, that shows the amount, the, the kind of content that is being consumed out there. So, for, from here, I would like to just point out the top three. That is uh, not the top three. Uh, three 
from the top five, that is Facebook, Pornhub, and Xvideos, which we'll refer, we'll refer um, back to them uh, as we proceed during this particular um, discussion. Then uh, the second graph that I would like us to also briefly discuss is the one on the, the number of internet and social media users worldwide in billions. I will all agree that uh, social media has played a very important um, or rather significant role when it comes to uh, the growth of the internet in the sense that um, initially I know for us to be able to communicate, we will have to send emails. Uh, that is, it will take time because someone will claim they have not seen the emails. But now with the rise of social media, we now have instant messaging. I can easily start a chat. And um, for example, I want to talk to my boss, I'll be able to uh, start a chat with my boss. Uh, as, a, as an educator, maybe I want to reach out to a parent. It's something very urgent because they, we have their um, uh, contact details. We're able to send them a message very quickly on WhatsApp, for instance. And also, uh, the fact that we uh, like to showcase the kind of lifestyle that we live. We have the likes of Instagram, we have the likes of um, um, Snapchat where we're able to take pictures and post them online for public consumption. So that really shows how so the social media has revolutionized how we access and utilize the internet. Again, I'm going to refer to this as we proceed uh, on with this particular discussion. So students online protection, what is it? So one thing I would like us to actually, um, before we even proceed further, is to understand what an online environment is. And from this definition, which is far much straightforward, uh, this is any digital space that allows individuals to be able to connect and interact in one way or the other. So uh, one can say that social media platforms is one uh, example of an online environment. So once we um, socialize on Twitter, we socialize on Instagram, we start viewing videos on TikTok, that's a platform where we're able to socialize them. Um, we have for the educators, we also have our e-learning platforms, the Moodle platforms, for instance, where we're able to post um, uh, our content, we're able to host our webinars, we're also able to um, share um, forum discussion questions where individuals are able to share different perspectives or their views concerning different areas. So that already brings, has brought uh, different people together and they're able to interact, they're able to exchange notes, they're able to talk to, to each other. And um, that also forms an online environment. So an online environment, in short, basically is just a, a, um, a platform or um, a, yeah, a space that allows individuals of whatever kind, uh, whether it's male, female, non-binary, whether it's uh, adults or children, to be able to socialize, uh, perhaps maybe uh, socialize because they have um, a common agenda or have a common, um, they relate in one way or the other. So an online environment, um, again, is an online environment refers to a digital space or platform that, that exists on the internet where users can interact. So having said that, what, uh, what are some of the characteristics that makes up an online environment? So an online environment allows us to communicate, allows us to exchange notes, allows us to be able to uh, seek clarification. Let's say your student uh, wants to find out uh, when a uh, particular assignment is due, they're able to communicate or reach out to you. Uh, let's say um, you have set students into a group and you like them to have a group discussion and make a presentation. So they have to be able to connect. And uh, because of their physical um, um, distance, so they're able to have an online platform where they're able to engage, come up with, the, finish up their group assignment and present it. Then they're also able to participate in various activities. So this particular online environment is very significant and it's important as educators and as adults, as parents, to be able to understand uh, the different online environments that are available on the, uh, on the internet and how they influence our, um, our behaviors, our social interactions as we proceed. So having said that, it's also important that we understand some of the internet trends that are influencing how we interact with uh, each other online. And when I say uh, interact with each other online, one thing I normally emphasize on is that while we may make reference to children, mostly when we're uh, discussing some of these matters, I will also acknowledge the fact that some of these issues that we encounter cut across all um, age, age groups. Even as adults, we may face some of the challenges that we're going to be outlining as we proceed. 
So for some of the internet trends we have, we have artificial intelligence, which of course is very, very, um, we will say a disruptive innovation, which has actually enabled us to be able to uh, make our work a whole lot easier. And I may quote something like uh, ChatGPT, which some of us have interacted with, uh, Google Copilot, uh, sorry, uh, Google Gemini, uh, we have Copilot as well, which have actually made work for us very, very easy. And um, as such of such um, in artificial intelligence, um, I mean, such technologies enhance our or make our work easier. They also come pose some kind of risks uh, that we shall also dive into uh, as we proceed. So um, I'm sure you've had cases where uh, you gave out an assignment, for instance, and a student came up with um, a, um, a, 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 a computer generated um, response to a particular assignment that you gave. So that also to a particular degree has influenced how we perceive artificial intelligence. While it is positive, it may also bring a cause a challenge when it comes to authenticity or how uh, a student may present the knowledge that they have actually acquired in the classroom. I uh, will allude to this again as we proceed. Then we have cybersecurity, which is a topic that I believe you have covered extensively, uh, considering the fact that um, we are here because um, we feel secure that we're able to interact. I believe a couple of years back, uh, around 2020, when we were having a COVID lockdowns, uh, we could, we, that's when Zoom came about and it became very popular. And one of the risks associated with that was that um, people could take over Zoom sessions. They could be able to showcase some pornographic uh, content. They should be able to use some very vulgar languages during presentations. And mark you, this did not um, uh, was not necessarily targeting adults because some of uh, the um, some of the teachers or instructors who are hosting their sessions online via Zoom were also um, subject to that kind of um, um, let me say threat. Uh, and as such, cybersecurity came up to be able to ensure that we are able to feel secure when we are interacting online. I won't say so much about cybersecurity because I believe this was extensively covered. So. Uh, from cybersecurity, we have uh, deepfakes. Deepfakes are like to relate it again to artificial intelligence, where we're able to come up with uh, representations of uh, or mimicking either audio or visual representation of a particular figure. And I normally give an example of, uh, in this case, when you're discussing children, I normally give an example of um, deepfake where um, someone is able to mimic your voice uh, as a parent or as a teacher. For instance, um, they happen to send a voice to this to a student telling them that um, this is a teacher, let me say teacher John, and I would like us, because you submitted your, uh, uh, your assignment late, uh, please make sure that you don't uh, leave the school without seeing me, or if you do, please meet me at a particular location. So um, with that kind of um, message and which particularly mimics the voice of teacher john and the, the attacker or the threat actor may go ahead and even use the picture of let's say uh, teacher john to be able to show just how um, authentic this message is so when the student gets this message of course because they're not very much um, aware of how the, some of these things work and that's why there is that's the reason why we're actually here because we're able to share this with them um, because they're not able to authenticate um, the originality of this particular message, they may fall victim and get dissuaded into some um, so something very bad. Something bad can happen to them just because of the deep fix. And as we proceed on, we have social media, which of course I won't say so much because it covers a huge section of what we're covering today. So allow me to skip this and I'll, I'll circle back as we proceed. Um, allow me to talk briefly about the mobile devices. Um, and I'll give an example of Kenya, where mobile devices have become very, very popular in the sense that um, approximately every household in Kenya has a mobile device. This means that um, we're able to communicate, we're able to exchange notes, we're able to interact with others. And this also ties into the fact that our internet connectivity has actually become a bit more affordable. Uh, to some of uh, some most of our households because you're able to even buy data bundles at a very low price so that in itself suggests that um, our connectivity to the internet as a household has also uh, become much more easier and i will also give an example whereby um, in our homes or even at school when for example you're taking uh, care of children and perhaps you have a very important or urgent 
a task that you need to finish up on. So what you do is that you just give your uh, the student your phone, tell them that, okay, you want to uh, watch these YouTube videos um, while I, I finish this task or go play a particular game while I finish this task. And that has been enabled with uh, mobile devices. Then, um, sorry. So having talked about some of the trends that are actually um, uh, that contributing to the diversity and also the threat that faces children only. And again, I'm repeating this, uh, some of these threats cut across different age groups. Even you as an adult, you may be able to relate with them at, particular, at a particular point. So let's talk about cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, I know um, may have been, you may have covered this, but just to reiterate what may have been covered is maybe um, you happen to share a picture of yourself and you've actually when you're sharing that picture you felt very good about yourself and uh, you wanted the whole world to see and appreciate the kind of person you are but someone somewhere because um of their whatever reasons they have they decided to make fun of you maybe you have a big nose uh, you have um hey in kenya forgive me for doing this but in kenya we're obsessed with uh, being bad so your hair in does matter a lot here in Kenya. So for example, you feel very good about yourself, but your hairline um, is interesting, for lack of a better word. You may get bullied because of that. And bullying, does, people may uh, post uh, very bad comments about it. Uh, people may even call you names or even threaten you just because you posted that particular image. Or in another instance where, for example, you happen to um, we have we, we, we normally have different topics or in discussion on the internet trending topics so you happen to post a very controversial uh, comment and remember you're entitled to a comment as well so having posted that comment someone um, digs into that uh, becomes very very abusive um, threatens you goes to the extent of even trying to locate you had cases where uh, a simple online argument ended up with someone being stabbed uh, which of course you can Again, Google that and you'll see that some some of these things have actually happened. So cyberbullying takes different forms, but basically it takes a dig at the kind of person you are, takes a dig at the kind of post that you make, and also um, the aim at making you feel more inferior. And considering the fact that um, we are dealing with children here, you can imagine just how a simple comment as you are ugly can go to uh, can be can be received by that particular child. Then, um, closely followed with uh, cyberbullying, have online predators and groomers. So, online predators, these are individuals who are actually more or less interested in uh, um, the sex, uh, uh, manipulating children sexually. And this normally happens a lot on the internet because you'll find, uh, for example, for some of us uh, who allow children to be able to create social media accounts. Um, you'll notice that some someone somewhere may create an account of they, they are, let's say they are around 40 years old but they create an account saying that they are 16 years old then because they are targeting a particular uh, girl that is perhaps uh, 14 years old so they have that language where they're able to talk to that girl they're able to convince that girl into believing that indeed this they are the, this person behind this particular um, device or the other end of the internet is actually a 16 year old boy but in real sense these are 30 year olds 40 year olds um very elderly individuals who are actually trying to manipulate these particular children and one thing about online predators and groomers is that the first thing they do is uh, because they know with children the first thing you need to do is trust so if they're able to gain the trust of the children then they are able to manipulate them very easily and how do they gain trust so if for example, you have a classroom or uh, you're a parent and you hardly ever listen to your child. Um, maybe your child has certain interest, but when they come to you, you just brush them off, telling them that, uh, no, you're, old, you're too old to be doing this. So by pushing them away, uh, they happen to um, interact with other people who are more than willing to give them an ear. And remember, um, trust is earned through more or less giving an ear because if I'm able to share my deepest secrets with you, that means that I'm, uh, I've gained, uh, you've gained my trust. So uh, once they gain that trust, then they start um, uh, talking, uh, having this, uh, this, now this is the grooming part. They now start um, creating some very erotic um, environment where they can easily manipulate these children. And for this particular section, 
actually does not essentially i wouldn't say that it majorly covers only girls because on we have had cases where also boys have been manipulated and i would like to quote one case before i even proceed to the next one is there's a case of a, a boy who happened to um get a stalker online so this stalker asked that boy to to send a, a nude picture of himself so once he did um the the the, the, the offender in this case uh, replied and told that uh child that um you either send me a thousand dollars or i'm going to post this image of yourself online and you know once these images are posted online it's publicly consumed and the child may become ridiculed. So this boy, because he could not afford the $1,000, he ended up committing suicide. These are recent cases, you can also Google it. So these cases that, that not only affect uh, girls, they also are very, very much evident with uh, boys as well. So we have identity theft and privacy issues. And this is a very, very emotive topic because uh, in as much as we understand that the fact that children have the right to privacy, where they, uh, they are allowed to express themselves, they are allowed to post whatever they want to post, some of the things they post actually could end up harming them. For example, um, a, a child who likes to post a different, uh, let's say they like going to a particular restaurant every weekend. So once they go to the to the restaurant, they may take a picture and take uh, post it on Instagram. So if I'm targeting this particular girl, I definitely know that every Saturday this girl goes to this particular restaurant at this particular time. And this girl or this boy likes to order a certain kind of drink. So it makes it very easier for me to come up with a package that I can use or I can execute to be able to manipulate this particular child. I may wait for that child on or that uh, on, on a weekend uh, for, at that particular restaurant and coincidentally that's in quotes uh, also order the same drink that they have then perhaps start a conversation to, oh okay so you also like this kind of drink okay and how often do you come here i like well, personally i like to come here every saturday oh so you also come here every saturday so already uh, um the offender or the um let me just call them the offender the offender already has a profile of this particular as a child, so they're able to easily manipulate them. And remember, these are children again, so they may not be able to notice some minor red flags. So the privacy issue here becomes very important that in as much as you want to allow your child to be able to post whatever they want to post, in as much as you like your, uh, your students to be able to interact online without any fears, there are certain risks that come with oversharing. And that is something that perhaps you, as educators, we need to be very keen on. So paying it closely to identity theft. So in a small, I may end up uh, posting so much. For example, I post uh, the year I was born. I post my full names. Uh, I post, um, I happen to post maybe my email address. So it, uh, for someone uh, as a threat actor, I may take that information, then clone that profile. Then once I've cloned that profile, um, I take your profile picture. Let me take an example of Facebook. I'll take your profile picture on Facebook, create an account with the same name as yours, then um, start posting some very um, pornographic content or some adult content. So when people happen to look uh, or search your name on Facebook, they say, hey, how, how comes uh, Jane is actually posting some very nude photos? So before you even get to convince people that that is not you, your reputation is already uh, ruined and it becomes it relatively difficult for you to be able to gain it back. And now that is from a, an adult point of view. So how about a child? So a child may not even know how to respond to that. And so it becomes very important for us to be able to manage uh, what our children post uh, online. Then uh, exposure to inappropriate content. Um, I'll take you back to the first, uh, the second slide where we're looking at uh, some of the consumed content on the internet. And remember, we saw uh, Pornhub and um, X videos as the uh, two main at the top five. So that means that in as much as many of us are consuming internet, many of us are also um, going towards this particular adult material. And it makes perfect sense that out of all these um, uh, billions of traffic going towards these porn sites, that at least a fraction of them is from children. So what are we doing as parents? What are we doing as uh, educators? Uh, we have computer labs in our, uh, in our institutions. Do we have filtering and monitoring activities that can ensure that our students are not able to access such kind of material? That is a question that we need to answer as, uh, ourselves. So 
um, children are, or also let's remember that children are also very, very curious. So the moment they happen to uh, find a, a, an interesting link with perhaps some other content, they may they want to explore that further. And God knows where that may lead them. May lead them to the hands of um, threat actors. And God knows what again may happen after that. So let's also um, take into account uh, the exposure to inappropriate content as a huge risk factor affecting or facing our children um, today. Then malware phishing and scams. Actually, this was covered very extensively uh, previously, so I will not jump so much into this. And um, I just like to reiterate the fact that, um, in as much as we're interacting online, we're also exposing ourselves to potential risks that we may not be able to recover from. So that said, I hope um, moving forward we'll be a bit more proactive when it comes to managing our malware, uh, managing activities of our children and that goes back to the cyber security skills that we, we have been taught during this course then lastly talk about tech addiction where i in as much as we might want to re deny this fact but the fact that your child comes from school or um uh, uh from a uh, you've given um your students a particular activity and the first thing they do is maybe check check on their instagram stories uh, they're able to go to go on TikTok, and TikTok has become very, very popular um, of the past couple of years. So the first thing they do is that they want to check what is happening online. And within no time, they start taking so much time on their online devices at the expense of their studies. So tech addiction has also become a huge factor when it comes to um, uh, some of the risks facing children. So that's it. How can we go about fixing some of these issues that we pointed out? So we need to have a conversation um, and educate our students on cyber safety skills. For example, tell them why it's important not to overshare. It's not, it's not a must that you tell um, the world what you're doing. And also, um, in the event that you happen to come across a very disturbing thing on the internet as a, as, a, as a child or as a student, how can I go about reporting some of this? I should feel confident uh, going to my teacher and telling them that uh, while I was serving this something of the sort on this particular computer, I happened to come across this. So you as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as an instructor, as a student, as an educator should be able to respond to that and able to stop that from proceeding. Then also, we you know, talked about um, cyberbullying. How um, do we respond to cyberbullying? You tell your students that if you're bullied online, uh, make sure that if they call you a cow, respond by telling them that they are a goat. And that only serves to escalate the situation. So you have to tell them the importance of not retaliating to such kind of uh, attacks. So those are the kind of cyber safety uh, discussions that you ought to have with your students. Tying that closely, there are some things that um, some of your students may not be able to share with their parents, may not be able to share with their um, with their guardians, but they may feel free to share with the, the, the teachers. So do, do you have an open discussion with your students with some of, about some of these things that they may be facing online? For instance, is there a certain boy or girl that is bothering them online? Keep sending them messages, keep sending them pictures. Do you have that kind of conversation with their with the students? That's something that you need to think about. Have an open discussion. Remember, one as I mentioned, one way in which students are able to be taken care, to be taken advantage of, is because they don't have a means to be able to express themselves. But you can make yourself available for them to be able to express themselves. Then, uh, monitoring and filtering. Of course, as I mentioned before, we have computer labs, we have phones. Do you have any monitoring? Um, do you conduct any kind of monitoring? Do you know, do you check your 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 students' uh, machines to check to ensure um, what websites they have visited. Um, do you have filtering mechanisms within um, the, your internet um, service provider or at a, at a computer level that is able to prevent students from gaining access to adult or inappropriate content? That is something that we also need to look at very very extensively. Then promote good digital citizenship. And this is where we talk about um, reminding you that the internet never forgets. So if you don't tell your students that whatever they post online may come back to haunt them, then it becomes very uh, hard for them to proceed or have a better life or become better uh, uh, digital citizens because they'll post a video of themselves, um, maybe in a, in a club drinking and all that, only for that video to come and haunt them when they're looking for a job. We've had cases where 
uh, individuals who are denied jobs because of a particular post they made on a social network. So this is kind of discussions you need to have with the students. Help them have a good digital citizenship. Let them have a very clean um, um, engagement when they have when they are engaging with others online. Then also parent workshops. And I'm going to take this in with parent-teacher communication. Make sure that you have cordial relationships between yourselves and the parents so that in the event that um, a child perhaps is not comfortable enough to discuss a particular topic with the parent, uh, they can talk to you, then you can relay this information to the parent in a more conducive manner that will not uh, victimize the student. Because uh, one thing that really pulls down our, our efforts when it comes to protecting children online is victimization. Because the moment you find them, let's say, watching porn, the first thing you do is you rebuke them as opposed to sitting them down and trying to talk to them, talk sense into them and telling them the dangers that they may face. So that is a huge area of concern that we need to be very much proactive on. So have that cordial relationship, call those uh, parent workshops where you all invite uh, parents to the institution, take them through cyber safety as well, because as I mentioned before, some of these skills or techniques for being safe online cut across different age groups. Tell them how to monitor uh, their children activity online. Tell them how to uh, enable filtering uh, mechanisms within their home environment for, uh, to ensure that their, their children are, um, are safe online and such kind of uh, activities. So uh, I know I'm speaking very fast. Uh, also apologies because I'm actually rushing against time as well. So um, having said that, I know you've covered a lot when it comes to some of the laws that support children online. So I will not talk about this actually. Um, what I'm going to do is that I'm just mentioning some of the in, in treaties and conventions that actually support or protect children. But we have in, international treaties and conventions which are of course, they are led by the likes of United Nations, International Telecommunication Union, ITU, uh, We Protect Global Alliance, amongst others. Then you have regional laws and policies, like uh, the ones in Africa Union, uh, the ones at uh, an organization of American states uh, in, the, in the US, uh, the European Union, which has its own international treaties and conventions that uh, govern individuals and protect children within those particular in, uh, geographical locations. Um, the reason why I will not say so much about this is because I know um, this was extensively covered in your um, in your course, but I'll be happy to um, guide whatever uh, in whatever area that you may find difficulty in. So some of the international treaties and conventions we have have the conventions on the rights of children. Uh, we have the International Communication, Telecommunications Union Guidelines on Child Online Protection. We have the Lanzarote Convention. We have the Optional Protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the Sale of Children and Child Prostitution and Child Pornography. Uh, we have the Report of the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights to Freedom of Opinion and Expression, addressing the regulation of user-generated online content. Uh, we have the Cyber Crimes Convention, also known as the Budapest uh, Convention. You can, uh, this uh, resource will be made available uh, to you, so you can also uh, read further about some of uh, what some of these treaties and conventions are actually talking about. Then at a regional level, uh, I'll start with Africa. We have the Africa Charter on Human and People's Rights, African Charter on Rights and Welfare of the Child. Uh, we have the African Youth Charter. Uh, when you move over to America, we have the Child Abuse Protection, uh, Prevention and, uh, and Treatment Act. We have the Children's Internet Protection Act. We have the Child Abuse and Neglect Laws. Then in the Europe, we have uh, EU Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, uh, the EU Strategy on Child Rights, and the European Convention on Human Rights. So some of these, uh, and these are not exhaustive. Uh, let me just uh, mention that. These are not exhaustive. We have so many conventions, so many laws and policies. Uh, in Kenya, for example, we have our own policies uh, under the Communications Authority of Kenya, which also uh, help us on how we interact with children, how we can protect children. So make sure that wherever you come, you're coming from or whatever country you represent, you're very much aware of vast uh, knowledge on what uh, regulations, laws, and policies that you have that can help prevent um, prevent um, exploitation of children online. And um, yes, I think that's, that's about it. So uh, as we rush against time, I would like to demonstrate a few ways in which you're able to make, uh, let's say you happen to come across um, 
a video or a photo that is not so ideal and you like to report it how do you go about it and i know most some of the most popular social networks that you have are, especially for children you have facebook although i know many children have moved away from facebook and have gone towards instagram because that's where uh, we were having a discussion with some of my colleagues a couple of days back and they say that as such, at this particular point many children view facebook as a platform for the old fellows like ourselves so they have moved over to instagram and tiktok because they feel that's where it's a bit more vibrant and the kind of content there is not uh, as moderated as facebook i don't mean facebook is not um i mean the the instagram and tiktok do not moderate their content but um of course you, chances are that uh, as a student uh, i may have a facebook account and chances are that my teacher also has a Facebook account. But what is the likelihood that my teacher has an Instagram account or my parent has an Instagram account? Chances are they don't even know that Instagram exists. So why can't I go and hide and do my work, uh, whatever I want to do at, in Instagram rather than on Facebook? So these are some of the things that have been informing um, children online. So let me just allow me to share my screen and show you how we can go about reporting some of these things. Uh, we we'll start over with Facebook. Uh, let me just find my browser. We'll start over. This is Instagram. So let's start over with Facebook. So on Facebook, when you go to Facebook, uh, you notice that uh, we have these posts, so many posts. So some of these posts, um, you may come across a post that you may you don't uh, want, you don't relate with, or you feel um, is not ideal. So what you do is you can just click this up, uh, uh, these three buttons at the top, these three dots, then select report post. So you remember this yourself, you're basically reporting a specific post. So you just click report post. Then this pop up comes up. So we're able to select whether you're reporting because it has nudity, because it has violence, harassment. You have quite a number of categories here. Is it terrorism? Does it involve a child? So let's say it involves a child. You click involves a child. So is it child nudity? Yes, child nudity. Select child nudity. Then, uh, yeah, then you click submit. I'm not going to click submit because I don't want to report, I falsely report this content. But then basically, that's the procedure that you can go about reporting. Remember, make use of these three dots at the top when you come across any particular content that um, is not ideal. Then moving over onto Instagram, similarly, remember Instagram is made up of, uh, it's actually parent company is Meta, so Facebook, so they basically have the same procedure. I'll find the three dots at the top, click report. Then a pop-up comes up, again, select the kind of um, category that you want to report. Is it nudity? Yes, it's nudity, for instance. Um, moving on to the next, is it nudity or pornography, sexual involves a child, the same, same procedure, then you happen to click, um, once you're done, you click submit report. Again, we're not going to report because this is just an example. Then lastly, although for TikTok, this mostly works well when you're on, um, on your phone. Uh, for some reason, this is not loading, I don't know why, it's good. So our uh, TikTok works best on phone, where you just hold on to um, you hold on to that uh, video. Then a pop-up comes up, where you'll be able to select report. So from there, you'll be able to report uh, that particular. You, you, you go through a step by step, uh, which will guide you on how to go about reporting it. Then, for, for example, if you have a um, you have uh, an account that you want to report, you click the profile of that account, find the three dots at the top then click report. So this is when you want to report a particular account on TikTok that you find is going against a particular, um, uh, some of the rules, of, we find some offensive material, whether affecting children in any way or promoting some uh, illegal uh, stuff. So that's one way in which you can go about this. So for, for the specific video on TikTok, uh, again, this works best when you're on phone because you simply have to hold on to uh, that particular video then click um, report. Apparently for these videos here, what you do is when you click uh, um, share, actually it's normally either you hold on to that video or you click or you click this share here, then uh, we'll find a report button at the bottom uh, amongst these particular options here, you'll find a report button. Okay, 
thank you so much john for that interesting um presentation we would like to look at the questions the q and a and i can see the first question we have what is deep fake yes thank you so much uh, so a deep fake uh, as i mentioned before this is basically uh, an image or a video or an audio that has been manipulated to um to represent someone someone else for example uh, let's say i want to mimic someone like um let me think of nelson mandela for example we know nelson mandela passed on but you may come up we may come across a video of nelson mandela dancing to our latest tune and that of course um when you look at it you'll say ah, how comes nelson mandela is dancing to this tune that came out just a couple of weeks back so they are making use of the imagery so they basically take uh, quite a number of uh, images belonging to um nelson mandela then they come up uh, with uh, uh, they, they train the, the machines to be able to mimic different movements and those movements are able to uh, make that um, um, video of Nelson Mandela um, video. And in terms of audio, we may mimic, uh, we find uh, um, someone may record your voice and clone it to um, make, make it sound like you're saying something different. For example, I may just say, um, hello, my name is John Sparaza and I am um, I'm uh, hosting this particular session today. And once someone captures that voice, they may be able to uh, manipulate the wording, the audio itself, to say something else. Say so maybe, hi, my name is, uh, is John uh, Baza, and um, I'll be posting something else, or something of the sort. So deepfakes, basically, they are able to capture or uh, mimic real world figures either in terms of their imagery or their audio to represent something that they may, they did not essentially see i hope that um makes some bit of sense that, that answers it the next question is do you recommend telling parents to restrict their children from specific sites yes um um, I, I remember I mentioned that in as much as the children have um, their own right to privacy, it is our responsibility as adults, not even as a parent or as, a, or as an instructor, but as an adult for us to be take care of these particular students. So you cannot, um, for example, watch a student walk uh, into a wall and not warn them that they're walking into a wall. So you have to have that prerequisite to ensure that they um, they are protected. So, simple answer to that particular question is yes. You have every uh, right to tell the parent that um, uh, please, um, protect, in order for you to be able to protect your child, um, perhaps you should monitor or block some kind of sites from um, uh, from them, ensuring that um, they are not able to access such kind of sites, and also ensuring that in the event that they access them, monitor exactly what activity is going on. And by monitoring, does not essentially mean that you um, um, you're invading their privacy. Here, you're doing so because you actually care about them, and also because you don't want them to get into trouble. So yes, simple answer to that particular question is yes, don't feel um, irritated, don't feel like you, your hands are tied. And also, um, one thing I like to mention is that it all goes back to how you package it. How do you approach the parent and tell them? You cannot ap approach a parent and tell them that uh, your child visits porn sites. Please make them stop. No, when you already approach a parent with that kind of a tone, already they become defensive. So as instructors, I know we know how to talk to parents, we know how to talk to students. So also watch how you are able to deliver this information to them. The next question is, what happens after you have reported, you have reported a post? And I will take this. So once you report a post, if, for example, if on Instagram, you've reported a certain account or you so the next step is they will ask you whether you want to block the account you reported or whether you want to continue by this person and then now from there the some sites will ask you whether you want like instagram will ask you whether you want to be alerted if initial have been taken or whether you want to be alerted if the post is taken down so the next question is about um 
it's actually related to the previous question and i would ask jones to take this uh what action does social media usually take after a report is made and how long does it take um thank you so much for that question um uh, social media platforms uh take have different um bureaucratic process that goes about um when you when you've actually done a reporting for instance um Facebook has, will actually uh, assign some uh, investigators to that particular post. Remember, just the post, it does not essentially mean that that post is going to be brought down. So once you report it, uh, they assign uh, a, a person, or depending on the weight of that report, a group of people that will investigate to ensure that indeed, if it's that video, or if it's that content, indeed, it has gone against certain um, um, policies that have been put in place. So the first thing is investigation. Once they investigate, um, I cannot give a timeline because it varies from different platform to a different platform, and also depending on how um, the, the, how many reports they are actually tackling. Because sometimes you may have so many reports, and you cannot say that you're going to respond to all of them in one day. So, in terms of a timeline, we may not be able to give a timeline. But the first step is uh, investigation. Then, once uh, if the investigation, uh, for example, Facebook, once you report, um, it notifies the person that you've reported that you rep your post has been reported for violating this and this and this. And um, good thing is that it does not say that who reported you, it just says you've been, uh, you've been reported. And the reason why they do that is so that you have a right to reply. So in the event that you feel that um, I've been reported wrongly, wrongfully, and you'll be able to respond and say that, no, uh, this video basically, or this content um, does not um, go against any 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 restrictions or any kind of policies so once uh, again uh, once you report um they are notified then investigation is done then if they find that indeed it went against uh, the reg certain regulations or policies it is broken it is actually brought down then depending on the weight of uh, that particular post or the report itself um they may go ahead and even inform um um uh, how, how the police they may go ahead and inform some detect uh, the detectives to go ahead and pursue that informa information for example if it is um it is a post concerning children and nudity or pornography of course just bringing it down does is not enough so what they'll do is they'll forward this to the police the police now will begin their own formal investigation which will take uh, whatever duration of time that it is going to take and uh, once that is done of course prosecution will begin, then um, um, possible incarceration. So basically that is it. So starting from uh, reporting, uh, in, uh, the user is informed, then investigation is done. Once the investigation is done, it is escalated if there's need for escalation or it is brought down if it's just uh, something that is not so waiting. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, it does, Mr. Baraza. Thank you. Uh, there's another question still regarding reporting. Um, sometimes on Facebook, someone can be suspended for a particular period of time without any report from someone. Uh, my question is, is there any kind of monitoring in, on Facebook from their own database? Uh, yes, um, over the years, we've had social media platforms that have employed artificial intelligence. Remember, I talked about artificial intelligence as an emerging trend when I do uh, at the formative um, session. So, many platforms have employed the use of artificial intelligence. And um, the good thing is that artificial intelligence is quite smart that it's able to detect nudity within a photo or a video. For instance, if you happen to post a video or a photo that is nude, um, it may be, it will be able to flag that photo as nude. Then also, if you happen to post a photo or a video that contains a child, it will be able to uh, flag that particular video or whatever media you're trying to upload. And uh, going back to, uh, to uh, TikTok, for instance, if you try to upload a video on TikTok, at some point it will ask you whether that video is artificial, it is generated by artificial intelligence, AI generated, or whether that particular video contains a child. So if you happen to select that it contains a child, it's the video or the media goes across additional checks to ensure that nothing has been um, and it actually comp complies to the policies within that particular social media. So 
simple answer once again yes they have their own uh, automated uh, checks so that uh, once the, the checks uh, have been made uh, and it's flagged then um, uh, now it goes under uh, manual review so once it has been flagged of course someone or a human being has to review and ensure that uh, indeed this thing has um, gone against our terms and conditions and uh, on what have you so yes they have such kind of um, technology in place all right, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, there's another question on, um, it may happen that sometimes someone may report for uh, malicious purposes. So does the organization go through certain investigations before blocking that person or individual that has been reported maliciously? And I think Mr. Baraz already answered this in that, um, he answered that the first step that um, any social media platform takes before taking down content, um, especially if it's been reported by other users, is to have investigations so that they do not block or uh, take down your content uh, before they've actually ascertained that it's um, it kind of goes against their code of conduct and uh, the rules of using the social media platform. So yes, investigations are done. Uh, there's another question on deep fakes um, and the question is how do you protect children from deep fakes uh, mr baraza uh, that's that's a very very interesting question that um uh, to be honest i will not say there's a definite way in which you're able to uh, report um, a deep fake or to uh, for a child to be able to identify a deep fake uh, but um going back to 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 cyber safety I know uh, one thing uh, we need to understand is cyber. Uh, so the deepfakes, for example, if uh, I want to mimic the voice of a parent, um, I may have to make sure that I have the phone number of that child so that I can send this audio or video to that particular child. So while I may not be able to tell that this uh, this audio or video has been digitally altered, uh, okay, we have the technology actually to be able to do that, but now I'm responding from a point of view of a child because a child will not, of, of course, get a video and try to run some technology checks against it. So um, now that's where the uh, teachers and the parents come in. You need to be able to ensure that um, the, the child knows that they should not be able to accept uh, fresh uh, friend requests so you should not be able to accept messages from people that they do not know and also yeah, actually mostly also yeah, they should not be able to just accept any friend request um, with whatsapp for example they should not be able to just open any content that has been sent to them especially if it's unsolicited and they don't know the person who has sent them so this goes back to this um the discussion you have with the students on cyber safety and how to become um, good digital citizens that basically uncover some of the uh, checks and balances that they need to put in place <clears throat> for them to be able to stay, stay safe. Then from an adult point of view, uh, we have technologies uh, that have emerged that are able to tell whether a particular media is uh, has been generated by uh, artificial intelligence or not. And that's why, for example, we have, if you have to generate some content from ChatGPT, you can verify whether this content, uh, even for plagiarism, there are some plagiarism checkers that are able to tell you that uh, this particular content has been generated by uh, artificial intelligence. So while this technology is still um, advancing, we believe that at some point we'll be able to have automated um, um, kind of uh, detection and response mechanisms within the different social media platforms, the different uh, chat uh, platforms that will be able to uh, detect that a particular media has been digitally altered. But for now, unless you happen to have the knowledge and the know-how of the platforms to test, may not be able to do that for an adult. And for a child, of course, you don't even have, the first thing you cannot even think about having to check if this is uh, legit or not. So that goes back to what do you know about being safe online? Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, maybe we can take one last question before we go to course announcements. Uh, so there's one last question uh, for you, Jones. 
um, due to portfolio requirements in Jamaica, we are asked to post on social media. Are you suggesting to inform students on how to report any form of cyberbullying beforehand? If so, does the school have to then have repercussions for cyberbullying, for example, in their school votes? Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that um, you know, when it comes to digital and data protection, is actually it's an emerging uh, trend within the whole globe. Just recently in Kenya, we had the Data Protection Commission put in place. Um, we have um, in the EU, we know we have the GDPR, which is basically protecting um, personal information. Then uh, for Jamaica, I'm not so familiar with the laws governing data uh, in Jamaica, but progressively I believe um, they may come up with something if none is already in place. But concerning the fact that you have to post on social media, I think um, as an institution, I don't know if you can come up with your own internal policies that define um, not just the kind of uh, things that can be posted online, uh, but also the degree which can be posted. So what do I mean? For example, um, you don't have to post the whole uh, um, information that identifies a particular individual. There's something called data anonymization, where, for instance, the data exists, but you cannot uh, directly associate it with someone else. So if that is a possibility, you can uh, try data anonymization, where you leave out uh, uh, the most identifying parts of that particular individual so that they may not uh, be subject to cyber um, uh, um, cyberbullying. Then, yes, again, as an institution, I think it um, it is your responsibility to ensure that uh, your children, your students, are actually safe. So, whatever mechanisms that you can employ legally, you should ensure that you put those mechanisms in place. Because at the end of the day, um, something may happen. Uh, you may not be legally culpable, but at the back of your mind, you say, "Okay, I wish I could do this." So let's avoid the part where we we start wishing we can do something, if we can do something now. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Barraza. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, the Q&A. Uh, now on to some uh, course announcements, uh, since this is the last webinar of the CTT course. Uh, so the course will officially end on Sunday, uh, that is May 5th. And this will enable us to generate and share your certificates within the following week. Uh, so if you have not completed um, any of the module assessments, please take the time between now and uh, Sunday to complete uh, all the course requirements. And just to remind you about the course um, certification requirements, um, which can be found under week zero um, under certification guidelines. Uh, there are two certificates that um, you are eligible to receive, either one of them. Uh, so there's a certificate of completion or a certificate of participation. And to attain the certificate of completion, you need to have scored an average of 60% and above in any of the three module assessments in the course. Um, as you're very well aware, we have uh, five uh, module assessments throughout the entire course. So if you do average 60% um, in three, in at least three of the module assessments, you'll be able to receive a certificate of completion. While if you do score an average of 50% and above in any of three module assessments in the course, you will be eligible to receive a certificate of participation. Uh, so you can only receive one of the two uh, certificates, uh, depending on how you score in your module assessments. Remember that you can retake all the module assessments to improve your score. Uh, so please take the time between now and Sunday to do that as well. And then lastly, we have uh, two surveys that are available to you. Uh, we send the announcements today. We have a tell us your story uh, survey that enables you to share a little bit of your story around online learning and also your experience as a teacher uh, with us and with uh, Cole and they're able to use it for uh, future engagements. You can be able to see an example through the announcements that we shared with you. And lastly, we have an end of course survey uh, that will allow us to improve this lovely, amazing course that you've just completed. Um, so please take the time to fill in these two surveys uh, for us to be able to improve 
um, the course for future offerings. Uh, we thank you very much for sticking around un until the end and sticking with us even uh, through the connectivity challenges that we face today. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the webinar today, that you have learned a lot from our guest speaker today. And thank you for your participation throughout the throughout the webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you for also joining us throughout the entire course for the last five weeks. Uh, I'm wishing you a lovely rest of your day. Uh, goodbye.